All right, so here we go with um, session two in our project management series. And just a few comments. I wanted to open up just with a little, maybe a few reminders about what we did last time. So last time was really more of an overview of the program and what we're going to do. Today is, is not an overview. We're going to start getting into some things, but it's still going to be not into all the, the details of technical tools. It's maybe still building on, on foundational items like that. And so I think that, that will help prepare everybody so that when we come in here next month, we're really going to be where the rubber hits the road and start working with some tools and looking at some things that are, that are much more um, technically useful every day. Some of the things today are going to be more about, you know, when you're in project management, you're responsible for coordinating activities and handling people and supervising people. And so it's going to focus a little bit more on that, how to, how to get your team organized and how to make assignments and things like that. So last time <clears throat> we talked about things like the benefits of good project management. What is project management and you know what's included in it and when I go back through the notes you know we had things in there that talked about well it's about scope and it's about budgets and managing risk and and the quality and you know things like that and so today we're going to focus more about project manager and if you remember last time KT made a comment about well there's project management and project manager so now we're we're going to float more toward project manager but of course the project manager exercises project management so I thought a good place to start <clears throat> is to just look at this little list here these are the things that we all um, laid out as our ground rules let me just take a moment to look at that and does that all still make sense is there something missing there or we're good to go with that Yeah, I think so. I, so <clears throat> last time, my, my impression was uh, we're really open, uh, we're engaging, so we want to kind of keep open-minded to learn some uh, new uh, skills. Good. Yeah, yeah last, last month was maybe a little slow to get our momentum, but I think by the time we were halfway through, everybody was getting into it and kind of sharing ideas and things. And that's really where a lot of the value is because the shared lessons from a group like this are, are pretty you know, voluminous. There's a lot of things to learn here. And collectively, um, we don't know everything. Well, none of us will ever, but we know a lot more collectively than any of us by ourselves. So with that, uh, I thought we will move to um, talk about what is a project manager. I always like these things with quotes. I don't know if any of you have gotten into the quote thing, but there's a lot of things that, that, that are used that maybe strike a chord with you and help you relate to your daily activity. This particular one <coughs> comes from a professor um, at a university in Canada. Management is, above all, a practice where art, science, and craft meet. And that's manager. So what that says here is that means you're an artist, you're a scientist, and you're crafty, I guess. But I'm sure you can all relate to that picture, handling all these things at one time, and, and that's not easy. So what I'd like to do is before we move a little further, last time we talked about what is a project manager, and maybe just we'll just take a couple of minutes and throw out, whoops. <coughs> Pick the bad one, I think, there. Maybe you guys have a couple ideas about one sentence or one phrase. What is a project manager? That's a word. So, a leader? Anybody have a sentence that would, that would really talk about what is a project manager? Project manager is accountable for the project done start to end. Accountable 
for project start to end. Okay? Other one? Make sure project's on time and scope on budget. So assures project on time scope and budget. Maybe one or one or two more. The problem hazard is the one who takes ownership of the problem. That has got to go. Let me just shut that off. Sorry about that. That will be a phone call at the break, though. Okay. <laughs> also have the good plan. Plan ahead. Plan ahead. Okay, I think that maybe sets a little tone. So there is no right answer, right? I mean, there's just a lot, there's so many different things, but here's three definitions of a project manager that I found through research, and, and two are research, one is, is what was told to me. But one is a project manager is the person responsible for leading a project from its inception to execution. So it kind of combines a couple of these things. Another one, a <clears throat> person who has the overall responsibility for successful initiation, planning, design, execution, monitoring, controlling, and closure of a project. That one might relate more in our business pretty well. And then this might be a more concise way of saying all of that. The ultimate responsibility for assuring success of the project. I like, I like the middle one, and I don't know if you can read that very well, but that chart really... I found those two things independently, by the way. The middle definition and the chart, and I was like, whoa, those things match exactly. And so I thought that had some real relevance. It's about getting the project started, planning it, executing, you know, designing and executing it. Um, the one thing we didn't say there that shows up here is monitoring, but I think when you say you're responsible for scope and schedule and budget, that implies that. And then closure, because it's so hard in project management, it's so hard to do the last 10% and make it go away. Just like it's hard to do the first 10%, which is the planning and really taking the time to think about it. So there's a lot of people that can do the 80% in between. And I think what defines a really good project manager from just average person out there is somebody that can do that front 10 and back 10% as well. Because that, that makes a real difference about how, how things happen. So you, you have a lot of uh, uh, material to come, but I, I wanted to make a note here. So individually, I, we're talking about a successful project manager today, right? So individually, I will be looking at uh, myself. Individually, I'm liking that I wanted to hear for the rest of the evening. Uh, am I liking individually on the execution elements of my project management skill set? Or am I liking on the closing part of project management? Then I'm going to be looking for those information to help me individually to, to uh, round up. Okay. Okay, very good. So what I'd like to do at this point is, is we'll break up into two groups right off the bat because I want to carry this a little further. And I'd like to, I'd like to focus on, on a couple of things. One, there are a lot of people in our industry that are maybe a task manager, project engineer, project planner, but, think, but call themselves project manager. And then there's people who are project managers. So there's a distinction, and maybe there's overlap. But what I'd like you to do is break up and, and come up with two lists. It shouldn't take very long. So a project manager or task, I mean a project engineer 
or a task manager some of the specific duties and responsibilities that person would have and then in the second column the project manager what duties they would have and there may be more there may be less they may be different but if you could just think about that and if you're looking maybe for for a little kickstart so project a task manager might have responsibility for overseeing design for quality control could be planning certain tasks project manager is going to have some similar things maybe but even more and they would relate technically and also interaction with your team so is that does that make sense so if we could take maybe we can just split down the middle if that works and, and just get two columns project I'll call it project engineer versus project manager yeah. because I think we want to start making the distinction of how you get to that mm -hmm. that next place can I make a comment on that too? sure if you look at our organization right now uh, individual look, look at people in on this uh, room here right we function across the whole spectrum individually at the at the some point of time but I think uh, you, what you're saying is individually we gotta be able to wear where at a given point in time of functioning as what. Sometimes I function as a design engineer, sometimes I function as a task manager, sometimes I function as a, uh, a project manager, uh, sometimes I function as an administrative person. So the, the more clearly we have in the individually which part of the task you're handling on in, in a daily basis, the better we, we can uh, kind of appreciate what we're talking about today. That, excellent point. And I think the, the real purpose of this is not to say we're not going to cross those lines anymore, but it's to look at in a growing organization, at some point, if you're managing enough work, you can't cross over anymore. And so you have to focus on those things there and build a team and mentor others to be able to pick up the other tasks that you've been doing. So I think that's the distinction we're looking for. So again, project engineer, project manager. So ready? Try those might work better. Is the camera on? No, it's camera. <laughs> All right. Um, so as requested, we were differentiating between project manager and project engineer. And so one thing that um, was shared is that, first of all, they can actually be the same person depending on the size of the project. But let's say it is pretty big enough and we have to distinguish. So the project manager is, is definitely responsible for the inception, for the scope, planning, monitoring, um, budget, obviously managing of it. Um, planning and scheduling is pretty much the same. They're also very responsible for client relations, making sure the client is happy with us. Uh, managing the design group, they're also responsible for man managing the sub-consultants. Execution, and they're also, they're the leader of the project. So that's, that's really part of being a project manager, is being that leadership for that project. Um, they're also responsible for mentoring the next wave of project managers. Um, then they also lead the meetings. They're also responsible for quality insurance and responsible ultimately for the success of the project. And um, obviously a project manager is part of the contractual um, component. Um, and for the project engineer, they're, they're basically the task leader. Um, and then also they're the technical leader and they are responsible for the plan specs, for the estimate, and they also have the opportunity to mentor the next wave of project engineers. Um, they're responsible for the middleman. I don't, I don't remember what that means. Yeah, the middleman between the project manager and uh, these oh, uh, sorry. Uh, young engineers. Yeah. OK, so they're the middleman. Um, and then also, yeah, between the project manager. And the last thing is that they're, they are the engineer focus of the project. And that's the difference between project manager and project engineer. Okay, great. Okay.
Okay, so we started with the, by defining uh, the uh, tasks and functions of the project engineer. Uh, a project engineer should be involved with the daily design activities and execution. That includes design items, calcs, reports, uh, QC, making sure that the design is uh, reviewed and, and uh, QC'd for every uh, part of it. Uh, communication is very important uh, for the project engineer to make sure to uh, share all the information with the designers, with the design engineers, with the, the drafts people, so uh, that can contribute to the success of a project. Uh, so the, the, what is included in communication is to facilitate calls with the clients, with the uh, sub-consultants, uh, exchanging emails with all the uh, people who are involved in the project, um, and then communicate with the project manager. So uh, the PM sh should be aware of all the details of the project or with the evolution of the project, the, pro the progress of it, the, the way uh, where it's heading. Um, so the more the PM is involved, the better, the uh, more informed, the better he uh, can manage the project. And then coordination with all the different parts of the project uh, if it's a, uh, I don't know, if it, if it uh, involves so many different items of design, then a close coordination will make it a more successful project. Um, so that's as far as project engineer duties and, and uh, functions are concerned. For the PM, uh, so the, the PM has to um, be able to monitor the project very closely. Uh, first thing should be done is to know the exact scope of it and the contractual part as well, which is very important. Uh, to, be, uh, to be aware of the budget, to make sure that it will not go over budget. Um, and then to know all the milestones of the schedule and the deliverables, uh, so th that's uh, a part of the PM's <laughs> duties, and to make sure that this information is shared with the with his team, so that way everybody is responsible and can can, can uh, uh, contribute to the to the del to, to delivering the all the deliverables on time. Um, Mentoring the staff is very important, so that that uh, can uh, improve the, uh, the the performance of the staff as well, because you want a strong team to make it a more successful uh, project, and that can only happen by doing, giving them a fair share of mentoring. Delegation is important if uh, the project manager has many things to be done. Uh, delegation is, uh, can, can facilitate or can uh, make his project run better with a close monitoring of the, all the details by, by holding maybe uh, daily meetings and going over the progress and uh, uh, ex exercising some micromanagement to the project. Then QC, QA, QC is uh, very important to, to do that on a, maybe um, periodically, uh, before each uh, deliverable to make a thorough QA, QC of the project. And uh, to, uh, to avoid risks, and, um, or actually to manage the risk, Anticipation can be a good thing to, to have at the very beginning, so uh, that's the way I see anticipation can be uh, 
that's one way to look at the anticipation, mainly for risk management. Maybe, uh, you know, you guys can help me more on this. Peter maybe can, <laughs> can elaborate more, but... Uh, and then, I think uh, we are involved with the client satisfaction one way or another. So managing a project is making sure that the client is satisfied if it's a, um, if, if we are delivering this project for a prime uh, consultant, we want to make sure that the prime is happy with the uh, performance and with the quality of the work that we are providing. If it's a, uh, if it is a uh, government project, we want to be on good contact and good relationship with the uh, design manager or the project manager on behalf of the government. So that's important to, to do. Engage in marketing efforts. Uh, that's uh, another aspect of uh, being a project manager. So uh, be proactive with the marketing efforts. I think that, that can be a plus for the business development in general. Um, and then obviously maybe th maybe this should take place at the very beginning to have a good thorough project understanding and to share it uh, to share the information successfully to make it a successful project okay that's it <laughs> sure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. That was good stuff. Um, it was kind of fun to watch that um, evolve because the engineers, man, they were right. Their first list was project engineer. That's where the focus went. Of course, that is what I asked in that order, but but it was like getting into all that, and they could have kept going on that list for an hour until tip time was running out and had to jump to the second one. And then yours started on the left side. But in the end, both of you see something in common. The project manager list is longer. Okay, that's probably the, the obvious thing. And then there's a lot of things when you combine them that, that come together. And I'm glad you guys had the marketing in there, yeah. the business development. So what I want to do is can share. I, can I look the, yeah, uh, of course. Okay, I'll take a uh, there's a couple of people that I've been talking over the years. QQC, they show up on both boards and they show up on both sides. Uh, <coughs> that's that one too. So that's a, that's a very, very good thing. Uh, Marketing is show up here. Marketing, to me, is a big part of a project manager. The one thing that I did not show up here is uh, it's, uh, the engineering decision making level of engineering decision making level. For project engineers, uh, you're supposed to make uh, the engineer, all the engineer decisions within the domain, within the task you are working on, and the move the project forward. A project engineer should not make an uh, engineering decision that relates to other disciplines or other parts of the project without the project manager knowing it, vice versa. Uh, the project manager should make a decision in context of the overall project. Uh, and inform the project engineer. So there's a really fine distinction between how much of an engineering decision making that feels the level of authority through the project. Uh, the more you understand that distinction, the better that can be. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because it dovetails. No, it fits, no I'm glad because it fits into one of the items here. Okay. So I, I just gave you two things and start with the, the one that says evolution of a project manager. This, this um, document was found very easily because I made it up about 15 or 20 years ago. And I used this extensively, and that's why I keep seeing that same error. And I had to put B2 on the bottom one, there, but never corrected it. But, I, but I've used this a lot. Now, initially, I used it because when I would recruit someone or have a conversation about someone wanting a promotion, I found this was a good tool to say, well, are you doing these things? Or 
to help guide them for their future, how they would grow. But I interviewed a number of people that would come to the company and say, yeah, I'm a project manager. And I said, oh, okay. And we sat down and looked at these two lists. And he went, ooh, wait a minute. No, I'm that guy. And so there was, when it's put in front of people, they start to understand where, where they have room for growth still. But I, but I want to point this out for a few reasons. One, it's not all inclusive of every, like you guys have a longer list. But it's got a lot of the key things. And it also would help you when you're dealing with your entry level people to maybe bring them along and, and show them some of the things. So just to quickly go through that entry level, you have people doing drafting, cost estimates, simple calculations, right? Nothing that's too involved. Research maybe, maybe simple pieces of design. Design engineer, that have been around a couple of years. And you can relate this in planning or in surveying or engineering, whatever. There's still a progression. They start doing maybe a little more advanced studies, start to have some interaction with the public agencies and do things like that. When you get to the project engineer, <clears throat> you start to see a lot of the things that you have on your list. Design, quality assurance. There's an expectation for technical competence at that level. Ability to make decisions and recognize when to seek advice. Peter, I think that ties right in with what you were just saying. Uh, increased responsibility, direction, leadership of the team. Intimate familiarity with the project. I don't need to read them all, but I think when you go through, they have to understand and be committed to the budget and the schedule. Begin interacting with clients. You know, that's maybe one area where I would say I would see probably a bigger shift on the right side here than the left. Client communications. Not that there aren't, because there are regular communications, but it's with counterparts a lot of times, you know, in the agency. <clears throat> and, and one thing I didn't see here was development of writing and communication skills. You, you had things in here about communicating and about email. And I would say the mind shift would be their job isn't to exchange email. Email is a vehicle. Their job is to exchange data, share information that's necessary for design. Email might be the method. So it's more about what, what's really going back and forth there because a lot of people are just saying Happy New Year, you know, and, and sending notes back and forth about meeting for happy hour Friday. But now when you get to the project manager, you start to see, again, some of the things you had here, leadership, lead by example, writing and communication skills. I, I think there's a, a real um, um, degradation. It's declined over the years, writing skills. And, and I would say if you wanna be viewed as a really top notch project engineer or project manager or just a person or consultant, think about how you communicate. Um, I try, and, you know, try, and I'm pretty good at it, even in a text. Complete sentences, spelling correct, and any email, not that, yeah, me too, and please excuse this error as I have an iPhone. You know that note on the bottom? I can't stand that note. I disabled that note right away, and, and I said, please excuse my lack of attention to detail, is what it says to me. And so people are always judging you on that, and when they judge you in that behavior, they're going to look at you the same way about how are you going to manage their project. Are you careless? Are you... And so. To me, the writing and communication, and I know that sometimes there's language barrier, that's a different topic than, than the effort to be thorough in your communication. So I think that's a big one. And ultimate responsibility, or responsibility for the project. Um, ability, and I know you had delegation. So delegating is one thing. Here it says ability to establish detailed task assignments and schedule and budget. That means you're not just monitoring it, you're creating it, creating the budget. So there's a lot of things in here that say I'm responsible for monitoring, but where'd it come from? So, and, you, and, and it doesn't mean you do it in a vacuum. You might do it with principal or you know, your team and, then you, and you collaborate on it, but ultimately you're the person making the shot at it, <clears throat> laying it out. And then um, you, had, you guys were close to that when you talked about marketing, but I even said, and I know, I know some of these things that I'm going to say, even though you didn't write them, I know you're doing them. So that's what's funny, like proposal preparation. But it's spearheading it. And a project manager, if you just leave it to business development, they can do a phenomenal job, but they're going to miss the technical aspects of your approach. And so to me, the project manager makes it their personal mission to win the job by adding that value in a proposal. So, and then 
I think you had anticipate there, Marwan, which is, you know, I think similar thing, recognize and serve client objectives. Whether they're a government client or anybody, you know, right. they all have their nuances and we have to figure them out and, and, and help meet them. And then, Peter, this is why I was, when you brought that last question up, why it struck a chord, because G, it just make decisions. And that's exactly what Peter explained in, in better detail about, you know, what does that mean? Um, get involved, interview potential staff, get involved in business issues, mentorship, outside involvement. I think if you want to portray yourself as that project manager and attract teams to you and clients to you, you have to go out and sort of be involved and be visible and, and proclaim yourself as that expert to some degree. So the the other list um, is something that that I just found through. Re oh yeah, sure, of course. Second, uh, yeah. Rick, I I wanted to echo what you said about writing and communication skills. Um, with, we're doing this because we want to learn, right? I, I honestly believe a lot of this stuff, like uh, writing, it's a acquired skill. It's a learned skill. I I can reflect. Uh, you know, I tested myself by myself. Uh, you know, I, I learned, you know, over the years, I learned how to write. I don't know how to write it it's, it's, as, as, a, as a, you know, a starter. But you learn those skills and you learn good enough to, to be able to, to uh, do that, you know, professionally. Um, also, I echo what you said about the, the overall skill set is really declining because all the you know, social media or the lack of attention to the details and people, you gotta have to uh, be willing to put the effort in order to get something out of it. And right. Very much important uh, <coughs> to it. Those uh, of us who are, let's say, past 10 years of experience, we used to write letters all the time. All the time. Now, there are very few. Everything's going in an email. But we had formalized letter writing for most positions that we were taking. Proposals, of course, we still do that. Um, but day to day, um, if we put a client on notice about extra work or, or an explanation, that was all in a letter. And the US Mail, US Postal Service got a lot of business from us. Um, and, and of course, today stuff's going back and forth in emails. And you know, I think we have, there ha we have to have some caution that maybe it's appropriate to send an email with a letter attached. So there's an independent documentation of the things that we do. And not everything, because we do have to adapt to the changing world, too. I don't want to you know, say that we have to be old school and everything. But to have a cleaner file that's easier to find stuff, that's going to make it easier for you to manage your project, manage. You know, we talk about scope. And the one thing that wasn't specific is scope creep. So. It's easy to look at your scope. What do you do if it's if it gets messed up? It's so there again. It's about decisions and taking actions when it's necessary to try to secure a change order. But uh, I think the writing skill is is really valuable, and I do agree. It's a learned skill. You get better at it, and there's tricks. And maybe someday we can do some sessions, independent session or two on that. You know, lunchtime thing it would be good. The second um, sheet here <coughs> was. Again, there's a lot of project management resources out there. So this was just another list um, out of the A&E industry. And they get into some of the same things. And you start to see uh, a commonality that says the things that, that you all put down and that are on these lists, we all understand the, the basic context of it. So I'm not sure. Strategic influencing might be one that's not there. Working with vendors. You know, that's getting in the weeds maybe a little more. Um, <coughs> so I, th I, think, I think, you know, this is maybe just good, good reference material for you. And again, I think it's good for when you're, you talk about mentoring your team um, to help guide. And when we go a little further in today's session, you'll understand why some of this stuff might be valuable in conversations with, with staff. So um, are there any, any other comments or questions or thoughts about any of these things? I think uh, Rick, uh, for the project engineer, a lot of counter they uh, get involved in a lot of this um, uh, uh, challenging of the technical design 
and then the, the, the present that uh, uh, to the clients and also the project managers. Okay. The alternative, you know. The right. Okay. So you're leaning on them yeah. to think independently and develop some of those things. And okay. Any other comments? I think these do these lists provide any value to everybody? Okay, good. <clears throat> so um, I thought we would take a break maybe in about five minutes. We will be near the halfway point, short break, if anybody has to check a message or do anything. and then. But before we do that, I want to move into one more thing. So I want to talk about, and all this stuff is kind of building blocks. So we're talking about what's our responsibility. And so to carry that a step further, <clears throat> there's a statement. Technical competency is vital. So I think my first question would be is, do you agree with that? Yes. So why? Well, because if you're considered the person to go to for that particular task or that particular niche or specialty, then you need to be competent. Because then, if, let's say you have a, 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 an overall project that that task is specific for that multi-dimensional task that they might have, and then you have that particular task, and you're the competent one, you have to be able to fulfill on that. Okay. And if not, then there's a gap. Okay. Everybody agree with that? What other, why else is it? Yeah. So I, I think it is to an extent, uh, because when you're doing specific project, project manager, as you over here, think they kind of have a full understanding of the entire project, if there's a specific task, you might not be fully technical content, or you might not fully technically be confident as your project engineer is focusing on that task. So you just need to be able to, I think you need technical competence. You need to be competent, but you don't need to be Okay. Anybody else comment? Or you're nodding, so. Okay. Bales, Peter, were you going to say yeah, something? Yeah, I there? was saying that uh, as a, in the context of the project manager, if you were kind of, you know, in a in a industry, you go talk to a client or go off the world. So who they who they look for? They look for project manager. Really, they look for project manager to give the job to. They look for project manager to uh, deliver the project for them. It's all about project manager. So under that context, I think uh, taking the competency is a vital, but we've got to look at the com competency in different shapes. Depends on what what you are talking about. Is a uh, uh, bridge engineering design competency or bridge engineering management competency or, or sewer pipeline design competency or am I in, in, in principle, I think uh, taking the competency is a vital. Okay. I agree with that. Anybody else? So I'll just share a couple of thoughts there. Um, one, if you don't, I think you kind of said a little bit there, but and you guys had it here, but if you're not technically competent, you really don't have a clue about the details of the assignments. You, you don't even know who to give what to or recognize if they're good or, or need help. So part of it's just understanding and being able to direct people. If you're not competent and you say, yeah, I need that by noon, and that person goes, are you kidding me? That's a three-day job. You have to have some level of confidence that enables you to put a budget out and give people direction. Um, another reason, um, back to that decision-making, if you have to have some level of competency that says something's not right there. We need to look more carefully at that. Uh, that doesn't feel right. It feels like we're going to get in trouble with it, or it's incomplete, or there's something missing. Um, to, to be able to develop the initial work plan and the schedules. If you're not technically competent, you don't understand what's the work being done, how long does it take, who are the best people to, to do it. <coughs> um, advise your client, and that goes back to what you were saying, Peter. That's why people pick a project manager. They're always concerned about the project manager. If you make a change, if you do this or that. <coughs> but the biggest thing is when you become an advisor, because you're competent in in the aspects of the, of the project, that's when you really start to attract business and, and reputation and things like that. But now to, I think this is gonna be the last one, it bounces so it's noticed. Okay. To your point, Travis, I will tell you it's not, 
from my own experience, it is not necessary to be the top technical expert. So as Peter said, there's a difference between being a bridge manager, expert at managing it versus designing it. I like to think of it as a level of competence that makes you easily conversant in that subject. And what I was hoping to do now, I can share a story first, but I was hoping maybe either KT or Peter could add one, but <clears throat> this goes back, gosh, probably 20 years ago. I had a small task order. It was for the Navy, as it turns out, and it was when they were doing family housing, and it was to do some planning and lay out some family housing on a hillside they had at Whidbey Island, Washington. And so I went up there and I brought one or two of my team members that was helping me and you know we laid out we gave them some housing unit types and laid this out and said gee here's here's about what you can do on this property and here's how many units you could get and um, here's about what it would cost and they're going yeah oh man we got a problem though with our sewer treatment plant down the street so I am not the sewer treatment expert but I know enough about it that I'm going well, what kind of treatment plant is it well it's this and that now two things. One, my antenna was up. Two, I had enough competency to discuss this and say, you know what? We have someone internal that I think can help you with that if this is your problem. Really? That happened from one topic to the next. The next thing, well, in the Washington DOT is upset about the intersection. Hey, you know, uh, what, what exactly is their problem? Understood their problem. We have a guy that used to work for WDOT that can do that. But, but my point is, by the time I was done, I had sent a person who moved up there for three months to work on their environmental document, somebody who did their treatment plant assessment and recommendations for upgrades, somebody who did their traffic. I had cultural people up there, bi biology, biologists up there. And so by having a level of competence in that technical world on all these things, we were able to expand our scope. And it wasn't car salesmen. It was, oh, I think we might be able to help you with that. And in the end, this thing grew tremendously. And there's a lot of other people who are not, who don't take the time to increase their competence that could have sat in that meeting. And when they said, we've got a problem with the sewer treatment plant, they'd be going, wow, that, that's really too bad. That's really messing them up. And they just sit and wait for their turn to talk about you know, the street or the grading plan. And so, the more competent you are about the things we do and the technical aspects of it, at least to a point where you can advise and consult, the better off you're going to be individually, the better off the company is going to be. So I don't know if you might have yeah, some I, similar I, I heard experience that. I want to reflect on <clears throat> the most in your work. So I, I'll say it in a different way. So you know, we're here to learn, right? So what, what is the barrier? from somebody to migrate from project engineer to project manager. What, what is the key barrier in my, in my view? The key barrier is that the project is, no, let me say the difference. The key barrier is the project engineer thinking and acting in the bubble of the project engineer. The, the project engineer, if he's not able to migrate into number eight of this list. That's the key barrier. Is that you don't see the context of other things. You keep thinking, uh, waiting for something else to come in to solve interrelationship problems. Uh, you, if you don't really go out the one next step to think of the context and think of uh, how to move things along, then you always stay in the project engineer's domain. That's how you're going to be. You're not going to be able to, uh, to migrate into the project management role. Another thing I wanted to mention that is that in the industry nowadays, uh, don't get confused by the title you hold versus your skill set. <laughs> That's a, you, you wonder for us to learn, we've got to have to break that apart. What, what the title you have is not necessarily the skills that you have. We wanted to kind of more more into the project management skill because that's where everybody's looking for project managers what that's where the value added is uh, everybody's looking for project managers all right great kt you have anything to add to that okay 
Well, maybe this is a good stopping point for five minutes. And oh, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, Travis.
Oh, guess what, Roy? I didn't have the mic on that whole time. What we're doing is an exercise where we gave a scenario where you're a project manager and you have a deliverable to a city for roadway, a retaining wall, and all the things that go with that, calcs, specs, also a letter explaining the virtues and value of the wall because it's been a contentious public issue. We also described attributes of the four team members you have and the exercise the two teams are doing now is they are determining who is the best person for each assignment in, in the deliverable and if they're deficient in any resources or if they can't use everybody and so they'll be reporting out on that in a couple minutes. So for, first off I think we have a pretty good team uh, to be able to just Sounds good. So I think we have a pretty good team. We did identify that we are lacking for uh, the retaining wall design. Maria, I believe she only had three years of experience and structurals, even though she wants to be a structural engineer, we felt that it would be best to hire a structural sub to be able to come up with the calculations, the, the retaining wall design, and then Maria can assist that sub with the plan and profile and the structural details and maybe even some of the calculations. That way she could get that mentorship from someone uh, outside of the office that has that experience. So Robert has a good understanding of roadway work. I believe he was uh, yeah, grading plans subdivision so we, did, I, we thought that Ro Robert would have a good, would be a good fit to do the plan and profile for the road and additionally with the cross sections. So with their with uh, Jennifer coming out of school recently it would be good to for her to work with Robert to develop the actual roadway cross sections which is down here so they, they would work hand in hand together to kind of develop that roadway plan and profile and cross section design specs we thought since Jose had the experience in construction the eight years he has the mo really the most experience out of the entire team it would be good for him to support uh, to take the lead on doing the specifications with support from the subs and Robert and to identify the little nuances of design so to make sure that the specs were uh, well written. Structural details as mentioned earlier Maria would assist the sub uh, maybe even Jen who she just came out of school with she has a little bit of CAD background they could kind of work together to develop that background material, especially Maria, because she is in structures, to understand and potentially at the next project she could come up and be this guy so we would could self-perform the work rather than hiring a sub. The roadway sections already mentioned would be Robert, Jose, and Jen working. I mean, Robert would be developing the actual design with Jen and Jose kind of assisting in drafting. Cost estimate, we also thought Jose would be good dealing with costs because he has eight years of construction experience in conjunction with Jen working on taking quantities from the plans and, and CAD. It'll kind of get her to understand the, the cost estimating realm of what we do. And then the narrative, we felt the narrative was on the PM and maybe Jen helps a little bit because she has the background in writing because she has a blog, I believe. But the, and there, the PM is going to be the one, the point of contact for the client. And really, since it's such a high-profile job, the PM would be the need to have ownership of the narrative to make sure that the public is okay with the job eventually. Great. Yeah. I'm going to pass that over to you. Comments? Hey! Well, let me know how the deliverable goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, looks good. <laughs> So, uh, first off, I think our team kind of... <laughs> our team kind of missed the last uh, paragraph there, where we... Would you need additional help? So, I think... Um, I think with... Now that I'm looking at it, I think we will definitely need some kind of help. But assuming that um, the project manager is a expert in either civils or structures, we will assume that um, he can be, he's technically adept in either one of them, let's say it's civil. 
So, um, having said that, our team consists of, um, for 60% design development, we put um, Jose as the task lead. Also, he's the lead on the specs and the cost estimate, because we figured the plan specs and estimate should, should all mesh together. So it should be led by one person. And then the, for the CAD support and design support, Robert can uh, support uh, Jose. He can probably support on these other tasks also. For a structural, we assigned uh, Maria as the task manager lead. And also for the details of the wall and uh, the roadway. And with having uh, Robert uh, support Maria for the CAD design. And then on the structural design, Jennifer. We thought Jennifer should support Maria also. And then while she's doing that, she can be um, more adept in uh, writing the, the letter. But she can, she can initiate it while the PM will get the final, uh, final preparation of the letter. So you'll be ready for the client. And then, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much what we came up with. Very good, thank you. Sure. Thank you. So I know this was quick. It didn't get into a lot of depth, but it does make you think about what can people do, what do we need done, and matching them up. And even at a quick glance, it's clear everybody recognized that the blogger, the restaurant blogger, would probably put the best flavor on, on that letter. And, and, but I like that you both had PM in there. It was high profile, but I think you guys had the same approach there because that's something important that you don't want just going out the door from a junior person. But the wordsmithing could be very valuable there. And then the, the use of, I think it was Jose, who's obviously working with specs all the time when he's out in the field to be on the specs and understand costs and quantities. I think those are all good things. The, the one thing that I would <clears throat> say don't default to, but I didn't maybe give you enough either, is don't default to a sub. My thought process on that would have been, I probably need to go to one of the other PMs and see if I can borrow his structural. Because want to keep it in the family. And only when we don't have that resource available would we, would we say we gotta go outside. So that's really the only thing. But the, the idea that you didn't have that capability there I think was the key point and, and you guys all grasped that. So um, is this, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm thinking kind of from different uh, perspective. So this, this exercise, so let's say I want the, the real application to us. That's what I wanted to comment on. Um, this is a very, very typical situation in our office here too, right? So two complaints I heard over years, whatever that is. One complaint from project manager is that, hey, I don't have enough resources. I don't have the right resources. I have a junior engineers that uh, you know, not be able to do whatever uh, is supposed to be done. The flip side, I heard a complaint too. Hey, I'm just uh, out of school. You've done more stuff to me. There's no coaching. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm swimming in, in the deep ocean. Uh, I, what I do? I think that's, that's kind of the reflection of this, right? Correct. It's, uh, how, from a project manager standpoint, how do you solve this kind of problem? Uh, if, if everybody has a perfect research profile, everything is at your fingertips. <laughs> we don't need to talk about it. <laughs> we don't have this vision, right? I think the challenge is how to face this kind of uh, diversity and be able to still function. That, that is that the core question, how excellent this PM is, and be able to be resourceful and be able to kind of uh, uh, function in those kind of difficult uh, scenarios. Uh, one of the things that uh, I reflect is that this is brilliant pain. You know, you, you got what you got, and you have to do whatever you do in order to move to the next stage of the business. Uh, be it that we hire more resources, 
you have better resources to work on the different group, all of that, it takes the, the process. In the meantime, we have to function as a unit. <laughs> right, right. But, well, you, you hit a really strong point, and there's one, only one other point I was going to make. And, and there's, a, there's a logic of the things we've done today, because what the two columns that we defined before, right? PM list was longer than the project engineer. And you had all these responsibilities on a project engineer. And yet, nobody noticed the absence of a, of a project engineer on that team. Two years out of school, a guy who worked in the field, a guy, which is to your point, I think. And so, some might have said, I gotta have an assistant on this thing. How am I gonna assure all this work's moving along? You got the assignments done, but, but there's, there's a big gap from the PM down to the next person doing work on this thing. So, so those are the things I think you're speaking of. And that's where you gotta do maybe some horse trading internally, or we decide, wow, we're not, we're not um, recruiting the right people. We gotta recruit two more of these in the middle. And the middle is always the hardest people to find. You know, for it's just challenging. Um, so, any any other comments or yeah, KT? Uh, working on it, the one is very right? And uh, uh, it's a one. Probably the PM could be the PM. It all depends on the size of the project. You may not afford, able to afford five people working on the same project, all right? So then it depends on the PM qualification. If the Timo guy is a top two guy, right? It depends on the jungle, right? If you need to. And it depends on the size of the project, right? Um, the PM, I think that the, based on the you know, conversation here, PM is not just to many. PM also is to technical. But I don't think that the, you would ask a PM to do structural engineering design. You can do it. All you must have to do it. If the size of structure is, if the size of project is not a big enough. That's right. Okay? It depends on the situation. Exactly. The right. leader has the right. PM because of my exactly. right. different The spots. PM got to know the specs. The PM got to know the quantity estimate. The unit price. Okay? Those kind of things. That's why, you know, uh, a risk uh, say, you know, how to become a successful project manager. Technical competence is the most one. Technical competence to cover many, many things. So I would ask to, because through my career, right, in the last 20 years, you know, I, I, I saw many engineers, you know, they said that, okay, they want to become project manager. But I really don't know what the meaning of project manager. But in many, many occasions, people mistaken that project managers do not need to do anything. They just talk and issue orders. Uh, this is a, 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 a kind of misunderstanding, okay? So here, um, many of you, you know, have been exposed to small projects, and greater the company is going to become a big player, all right? So we're going to be exposed you know, to more projects, larger than what you are doing. So you got to open up your mind and uh, like, you know, I mentioned to Rick that some of you might spend your own time up to five o'clock to do work, all right? Uh, that's my uh, you know, uh, sharing uh, with the team here. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that, that's good. The, the other thing to add, because that triggers a couple other thoughts and it goes back to something we talked about early, earlier, that as you're doing this and you're creating these expectations for everybody's roles, there's gaps. And so, to your point, you gotta have some expectations of yourself that you're gonna kick in on this one. But those would be conscious decisions. We don't have that project engineer available, so you're gonna have to do these things. And we're gonna have to figure out another way. So that's the main point of this, is to identify those things and, and recognize, and don't just throw up your hands, ah, just get it done with what I got. It should be an open conversation so that we're making conscious decisions about what we're doing, because that's how we weigh the risk and make sure that we're doing things right. And if it's that that risky of a thing, then we might have to bring somebody in to help a little bit. But that would, shouldn't be our default point. So um, we fell a little bit behind, but we're, we're, still, gonna, we're still gonna make it because this is really the last topic of the day. And this is, 
um, a, a very small, <coughs> small piece of situational leadership. This has been around for a long time. This Dr. Paul Hersey is the creator of this, this concept or um, you, know, you know this approach. Later, he did some other work with Ken Blanchard, who's, who you'll find is the author of One Minute Manager, along with another guy. He's always got a second person. Um, but, but in this, it's like, you know, what is this? So you can see the quote from, from the guy who invented it, a situational leader is anybody anywhere, could be us, that recognizes that influencing behavior is not an event, but a process. So people change, we have to change with them, we have to recognize what we're up against. And, and so, so how does it apply to us? So I'm gonna give you just a quick overview of what, what that chart means. And then I'm going to explain the best example I've ever seen that's an analogy to this. And I'm sure all of you will relate to it. Then I'll relate it to how that affects our workplace. So there are four boxes there. And you can see from right to left. We don't go left to right on this one. We start with S1, and it says directing. And then it moves into, um, in, so it's telling. You can see in the bottom left of the box, telling. The box above says selling. The one on the right says participating. The one on the bottom left is delegating. This is, those words apply to you, to the project managers, to the coach. You're, you're telling, you're selling, you're participating, you're delegating, okay? The other words, the small words in the upper right, and in, in the case of selling, or down below here, let me just go right over here, um, where it says high direction, so that's you, given high direction, low, supportive behavior. You don't have to do much, okay? And up here, high directive and high supportive behavior. You have to do a lot more, but you're still directing your staff. Over here, low directive, high supportive. So you're participating. People are getting assignments and you're having to help and be active, but not, not every minute. Delegating, low directive, low supportive. Somebody's got it together, okay? now. I, I apologize, this didn't come out so good. Over in this first box, and you go right to left the same way, the, um, this is again low and um, supportive, but down below it says high commitment. The commitment relates to the employee. They're very committed, right out of school. I'm so committed, I'm so excited about my job. You get up into this area here, as you move across, commitment gets lower the employee's commitment. When you move and you start supporting them more, that says variable commitment. Depends on the individual, the pace that they're learning and growing at, and when you get back in here where they really have their act together and you can just delegate, they're once again highly committed. Okay, so what does all this mean? So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the story that I'm gonna use to share this, which is the same story I got. And who has not seen The Karate Kid? Everybody's seen the movie The Karate Kid, right? Okay, so have any of you heard this analogy to this before? All right, let's, we'll talk about it. So right now, let's, we're, we're talking, think of, think of Danielson as an entry-level karate expert. He knows nothing, but he's getting picked on, so he wants to learn, right? And so he's got a problem. The mentor, Mr. Miyagi, brings him over and says, I'm going to help train you. And what does he do? He gives him wax. Wax my car. Wax on, wax off. No, this way. So he's yeah, marks this guy's car. Wax on, wax off. He's shining a lot of cars. He has no idea why, other than he thinks the guy's just using them for stuff. And then he's like, what the heck? And he goes, huh? Oh, enough wax on, wax off. Daniel thinks he's going to get something fun. Paint the fence. Now he's painting the fence. And remember, he's very particular about the hand. He's painting the fence. Highly directive. Okay, but the kid's committed because he's excited he's got something new. All right, but after doing that for a while, all the cars are shiny. I don't know if you remember how many fence he painted. All of a sudden, his high commitment starts to drop, and he's like, what the heck am I doing this for? He's mad. Remember that? He feels like he's wasting his time. All you do is that. Okay, so now um, Miyagi, the mentor, realizes that and now we're talking about situational leadership. Anybody anywhere has to, um, is not an event, it's a process. So now he's in the next phase. He goes, oh, I can't just direct this guy anymore. 
So now he's, he wants to bring relevance to what he was doing. And while the kid's all upset, he goes, um, Danielson, uh, wax, wa wax on. And then he goes to hit him. And if you remember, the kid instinctively does that and knocks his hand away. And then he goes to do some other move. He says, paint the fence. And he knocks his hand up in the air. And all of a sudden, he's going, whoa, whoa, I see what, I see what this guy was doing. OK, so now, now his commitment is, was waning, right? And it was pretty low. That's when he, was, when he moved from, he was here. He got up in here, and it went low. And all of a sudden, Miyagi, you, the PM, us, you got to sell. That's why he's giving him the relevance of it. OK, and he's trying to get his low commitment brought up. So when he gets into the highly supportive behavior, it moves through here, highly supportive behavior. The next scene, you may recall, Miyagi is sitting in the boat with him. Everybody remember that? And he's got him standing at the tip of the boat, and he's getting his balance, and he's doing all that stuff. And he is, he is hands-on with this guy, totally hands-on. There's no delegating and walking away. Everything he does is with him. He had him standing on a tree stump, I think. He had him, everything he does, he is right there. And what he's doing is he's, he's getting the low, the low commitment. He's trying to get it up. That's why it's variable. And, and all of a sudden, the kid is gaining competency in this area, right? He's got, he went from um, low competence, low to some competence. All of a sudden, he's starting to get some moderate competence, and he's getting better, and he's feeling more positive about what he's doing. Now he, he has all that hands on. So now as he moves this way, he is, now he's actually fighting. And I think Miyagi initially is near the ring and actually does some support stuff for him, right? But supportive. He's not there every second, okay? And so he's got competence. Now the kid's pretty committed. And as he moves to the fourth, the fourth um, quadrant there where he's delegating because now the kid has developed high competence, you may recall the fight's going on, and Miyagi's standing at the back of the room. I think something like this. He's just watching. He's not doing anything. Maybe if called upon, he might have to come in and help, and that might have been where this came from. But those four things he went through, you can see how he had to recognize the lack of interest, the competency level, and the selling is critical. Now, let me relate this to our world. I have a new intern or a new grad working for me. And I say, OK, I got this cost estimate. I just want you to make sure that number times that number really is that number there. Just check the numbers. OK? And when you're done with that, there's a table on the plan. And it has the length. Just make sure that length is that length. OK? He's like, OK. And you're out of school. Ah, this is fun. You know, and you're doing this stuff. I remember one of my first assignments as an in intern it, in the city of Chula Vista, they had a, an assessor's parcel map book. And every time they got a street dedication, they hand wrote in the recording information on it. The book was this thick, those kind that are bound with bolts. And one of my first assignments was, hey, we have this book that has all the dedications we've got over the years, and they're all handwritten in there. We, we, we want to have another copy. So I've got the book, and I'm hand copying page after page. You know what? It was fun. It was my first job. Man, I was. I was I was right in there. I was being directed. I had, I had no clue of the relevance. Who's going to use this book? Didn't really matter. Well, at some point you're going, I'm getting pretty tired of tracing this. What the hell? Okay, okay, okay. You know what? We're going to start having you check street dedication plans and teach you about surveying and stuff. Because otherwise, I'm not that excited. I liked everybody there. I'm just not that excited. This is the area we're really vulnerable at. And I'll just give an example. Your employee could love you. I love the guy I was working for. Um, and so there aren't any signals. We have to pick up on it. So somebody like um, Iha could end up in that second quadrant. She loves everybody here. I think it's, she's got great mentoring. And yet, there's maybe something there that wasn't enough to see the relevance of her future, even though we think we're doing all those right things. So some people won't tell us. We have to see it. And that's why we lose people in that, in that two year, three year, I use one name. There's, you know, we all know numbers of them. This happened to all of us over the years. People we have good relationships with. It has nothing to do with that interaction. We just, you know, we just weren't holding on to them anymore. They were doing too much um, paint the fence, you know? And so somewhere in there, we have to change that assignment. And we say, uh oh, they're getting bored. I'm tired of 
seeing extension numbers, you know, multiply outright, and we got to go, whoa, whoa, let me, come here, come here. Now we got to sit side by side with them and give them examples how quantities came in and the contractor bid it, and wow, what a problem this was, and now start to show them how to pull quantities off plans and read plans better. It's the hands-on part, right? Maybe it's design. So you know, whatever the task is, it's more, more supportive, more interaction, more. Um, Selling, that's a bad, it sounds like a negative word, and I don't mean it like we're trying to sell them and put something over. We're trying to show them the, the potential and the benefits of sticking it out with us. And if we can work through that, we have the, the opportunity to now continue participating, maybe not every minute, but enough that they feel that support and that they're really making headway until they get to the point where they can be that project engineer or that independent person working on something. So. I always felt that movie, I was like, did the guy who wrote that movie, did he know this stuff? Or is it just somebody who's sharp about human nature? And the movie came out that way because you would never think you'd get a lesson out of a movie like that, you know? Not an Oscar winner. Um, and the same thing happens. There was another movie, a chess movie. I think it was Sean Connery and a street kid um, who steers clear of all the trouble and gets attracted playing chess. Anybody see that one? I'm drawing a blank on the name of it. Same deal. He went through the same exact things. First he gives kid advice through the door and eventually they have a relationship and um, before long the guy's basically observing him checkmate everybody because he's taken him that way. So you know the, the idea of this and the relevance to us is, is about recognizing there might be a point where we're we're delegating all these menial tasks that are important because you have to start somewhere and get some foundation. But then it becomes more burdensome that we have to coach more and we have to be more hands on. And do we have to do it all ourselves? Not necessarily because we might have somebody else with us and say, I want you to spend time with that person. And, show, and I'm going to explain to all of you, but then spend that time and teach them more about why they're doing this and the relevance of it and how it has that. It's kind of like we were talking about. What, what's our, our vision in the world? What do we want to contribute to? And they want to feel a part of that, that they're doing something more than checking numbers. And how does it tie in? And that's where our satisfaction comes from in here. So does this stuff make sense? Now, I'm giving, honestly, I'm, I am not a qualified situational leadership teacher. I am giving you, if I said half a percent of the program, I'm puffing my chest out way more than I deserve. This is the smallest fraction, but it starts with that, that basic behavior. And I think there's things there that even without being experts on it, we can recognize because we live with it. If the guy could write a movie without knowing about it, you know, we can live it in the workplace. So, so I think, you know, when you talk about how you're making these assignments, you know, and we're saying, I'm going to give this assignment to Jose or somebody Think about where they are and what you might have to do to maintain that, to direct them and then help them work through to a competence level so we get them through the tough part where they see the benefit and they, and they feel like they want to be part of it. And we all know that up there there's a lot of worthwhile. It's their confusion or uncertainty or, um, you know, I don't, I think at that lower level, people always say, oh, people leave because of their supervisor. I don't think that's so true in the early stages. I think in this day and age, the people coming out of school, they just used to, they see everybody hopping around. Oh, I can get something better. And we have to help them understand, you know, you, you can get it right here. And, and I'm going to help you get it. And so um, that's, that's basically the, the piece that I had on that. So are there any questions or comments on that? Yeah, Margo? I think it parallels uh, the hero's journey, which is what a lot of myths and movies follow, the journey of like the the hero, he finds like a, he has a mission. That's when you find a mentor, that's a delegator. And then like a, a movie like Star Wars, when you're the most vulnerable, like the SP, I think that's when he was most vulnerable with the, with the, with the dark side. And then uh, I think, yeah, basically he probably the same logic. Yeah, the nice, Let's totally see that. Pretty soon, they're just standing back and he's the Jedi on his own. Yeah. Teaches, and then he's got to take that upon him at some point to bring it to somebody else. Right. And that's one of the things that, as we go forward, you see the, the importance of, it's not just delegating, it's actually creating an environment where somebody can really learn it, learn what you know. 
because the only way to move to a different level is you can move there, but we're like we said, we're crossing the line. So we're, eh, you know, we're like we're like a seesaw. We can't fully be a project manager because we don't have. So to get to that next level, we have to help somebody else get competent there, and then we can go. Hey, I can do more things for the company here, and for your satisfa personal satisfaction because those things all tie together. The more you enjoy, the more value you bring to your organization, and then you know, there, there's a number of levels and. Um, there's a lot of reading material on that stuff, but that's the basics of it. Um, and it's more about coaching at, at this point. And keeping your team together. I said it before, I don't know that you can ever say it enough. Keeping your team together. And when I say team, it could be two people, five people, or all of us together. Keeping a group together is, is the most valued thing we have because the time and expense of trying to replace that and the emotional um, challenges are, are a lot. They take a toll. And if we can find a way to give everyone their fulfillment here in this environment, we're going to be a lot better and a lot more successful. <coughs> a lot more fun and it feels good when we get stuff done. And we're going to stumble along the way. I mean, you can't just read this stuff and then we're going to do everything right. You know, it's about lessons learned and it's about probably, that's probably another thing that we could have added to these. The PM brings the lessons learned to everybody and what did we learn before that, let's not make that mistake again. That was painful last time. And so I, I think there's, there's so many things we can do. Even, you know, even if it's something as, as horrid as learning SCADA, you know, which I'm trying my best not to learn very much. <laughs> um, learned more than I planned on. But, um, so anyway, that's, that's a situational leadership piece for today. Um, we want to help people be successful. I think that's the number one thing. I always said, look, somebody makes a mistake or they do this or that. It's not about reprimanding people. It's about coaching them. Now, if they keep doing it, you know, at some point you're going, hmm, maybe they don't fit, you know. But, but our mission should be to give a, every individual every chance to be successful, you know, with the, within reason. So we want to know about their strengths, we want to know about their aspirations. I think if we understand that and their interests, we're going we're gonna to do better at that. We want to match assignments to those things best we can, of course. Regular prompt, prompts italicized feedback. It doesn't do any good if you make a mistake and I tell you about it in three weeks. You're going, huh? But if I tell you about it tonight or tomorrow and go, hey, you know that thing yesterday, it was this, thing. you understand it, you feel coached, we move on. If it lasts a long time, number one, I'm kind of a kind of a I'm a lousy manager unless I was out sick for three weeks. That why didn't I share that with you? I've always believed you should learn nothing new in an employee review unless it happened in the last few days. Because we should be sharing those things along the way. Um, flexible in your approach to coaching mentoring, back to what we were just talking about. And that takes us to the questions. I'm, I'm just gonna um, make one more quick anecdotal comment because it's about treating people, a certain, how you treat people. Um, and I always had this thought that I'm going to treat everybody different but equal. What does that mean? It means you have to understand each person. And I always related it back to all the years that I coached Little League. I have the one kid who is, who is a brat. He's hassling all the other kids and he's taking their hat off and throwing it and running away and throwing it in a ditch and all that. And one day I look at this kid and I go, you know what? I pin him down on the ground and I take his two shoes off and I throw it in two different directions. I go, there, now you know how it feels. And you know what? I know this kid comes from a broken home. No one ever disciplines him or shows they care about him. The rest of the year, and I wasn't mean, I just did it matter of fact. The rest of the year, this is the kid who wants, can I help you coach? Who's hugging my leg? Who's, because no one ever paid attention to him. So the recognition is that he's starved for attention and discipline. There's another kid who comes and he's like my number one catcher. And we have a big game and he comes and he's, he is over disciplined at home all the time. To his mother's credit, she always goes, when he gets to the field and walks over the line, he's all yours. And so he comes up and he goes, I don't think I feel like playing today, coach. And I, inside I'm going, <laughs> I got another this kid behind the plate, you know? And I'm going, well, uh, you know, because I know what he's, he's looking for. You're going to play. It's part of the commitment, because that's what he's used to. And I went, well, you know, if you don't feel up to it, I can probably get Joey to 
fill in for you. Let's just go sit down there for a while and see. I want you to feel better. And he's going, hey, wait a minute. I, I wanted him to beg me, you know? And so I go to the other kid and I said, can you be ready to catch? I don't think it's going to be necessary, but it could be. Yeah, okay. So about 15 minutes, everybody's warming up. Kid comes back. Coach, I I'm, I'm seem to be feeling a little better. I think I might. Are you sure? Because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hurt you or anything. Some kids, just like employees, will feel crushed if you, if you relay your message to them too sternly. They don't respond to that well. And they'll break down and they'll shut you up. Others want it straight. I'm a facts person. Give me the facts. So it's up to us to recognize how we treat people. And it's, like I said, different but equal so they don't nobody gets more favors it's just understanding what makes somebody tick and when you understand their their that's part of the aspirations when you understand what somebody wants and what's of interest to them then i i think we have a much better chance of building a better long-lasting team so i'll just leave it at that and if there's any final questions for today we are we are gonna get everybody a copy of the One Minute Manager, and we'll get that sent to everybody in the next week or so. And hopefully, not hopefully, you should all read that before the next, the next session. That means to get through that book, you might, because of the thickness of it, between now and next session, you might have to devote 45 to 90 seconds a day to it, because that's how short this book is. But I think it'll be valuable, and it'll talk more about this coaching stuff and how to, how to build your team and and interact with people as a manager. So, okay. So one of the, I think the drawback of us being here is that we are very technical, right? Uh, we don't we don't see this uh, situation of leadership stuff as important as our technical skills. Uh, I think that's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really, really is. A lot of lot of us not exposed to the softer side of things. But what, as your career advances, those softer stuff becomes more and more important in order to function properly, in order to build an organization around you, build a culture around you, build a long lasting you know, value to what you do. You know. Right. And it's a very important how to engage with people uh, properly. Uh, either their clients or peers or subordinates. Uh, it's, all, it's all skills that you can acquire, you can learn. It's not like you have to know those things. I, I, you know, you and I, we don't know those things when we first started. But uh, it's a matter of paying attention to, to be hungry for new things. I mean, we, we got to have to be open mind to learn new skills. That's, that's how we improve ourselves. And I think those are the the key things because there's a little momentum thing here when you when you talk about these things and then you read a book like One Minute Manager, which by the way is written very simple. When you read that and you read other stuff, you get this. Wow, I feel like I know more stuff, and it actually makes you feel better, like like you like you're improving yourself and your interactions with people. And it's not just employees; it would be at home and and a lot of a lot of things in life and. You get a little hungrier for that yeah. stuff, and you you feel you actually feel as time goes on that you're becoming a better person and that you're helping other people more, and that's a good feeling, and it does translate to our technical world it does. because yeah. people got to be mentored in that technical stuff, so it just helps you in your approach to how you it bring makes, them along. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. How do you relate certain pieces of information in different ways? Because one of the difficulties as a human being, I mean, I'm talking about this, maybe it's too big a term now, <laughs> <laughs> is that how do we control our personal emotions off on the situation? Uh, a lot of times we just you know, kind of do it. But there's a skill to it. you got to have to manage your personal emotions to address a situation where most beneficial for all parties involved. You want to put a certain words certain phrases in certain context so that it's, a way, it's better received but delivered the same message. Right. The fact is the same fact. <coughs> but it, it got a totally different outcome of oh. the engagement interaction. Yeah. 
That sounds like a conversation that Travis and I have had many times <laughs> about when there's a big issue. I always, I don't know if you would even remember what it is, but my advice about those things is, is but don't make it personal. Yeah, don't make it personal. Yeah, don't Deal in don't facts. Yeah. And, and we'll, yeah, one of the, the advice, piece of advice I got was run something through your head before you say it. And the question you ask yourself is, what is to be gained by saying this? Because you might only inflame the situation and actually work away from, you know? And so it's kind of like, and that's true at home. That's why husbands and wives argue over silly things. You go, I don't know why you did that. And you know, nothing's going to change. So it's like, what is to be gained by this? I could just swallow this and in about two and a half minutes, we're going to forget this even occurred because it's so trivial. And maybe really I'm just tired because I work 14 hours today and that's really the root of this. But it's the same way with a client. You choose your words and run it through your head first. What's to be gained? Sometimes nothing. It's the other way around. You know, so, yeah. But KT and I were talking. It's not just the soft skills here. It's this in the workplace. It's our clients expect us to do more than just the technical stuff. Years ago, we just man, if you're doing design, that's why there was a lot of sweatshop engineering offices just cranking work out. But all of a sudden, it became necessary to deal with the community and deal with the other department and talk to those people and win them over. And so they're looking for project managers that that can deal with both sides, not just over here. They can find anybody to design stuff, but it's how you control the other pieces and fit it all together that separates us. So, any last comments then? Yeah, um, when you had, I want to point out about the situation on viewership, people back to that slide, um, we actually cover from the beginning at one through at four. But sometimes you will get a team member who are at the stage of either two or three or four. Correct. So it is very important that you fully understand your your source, your human resources in your team. And depending on what stage they are in, you need to deal with that person. If, if the person is at, at three, and if you are treating him as a kid at, at one, they are not going to stay along. So he mentioned that, you know, um, I'm going to treat employees, I'm going to treat everyone differently, but it was exactly the same period. Good point. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. Um, and, and sometimes we can revert back if we're doing new things. I need to be directed again. I don't know what I'm doing on this. Yeah, so. Okay, well.